Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy July 1st, 2020. The beginning of the second half of the year has officially arrived. My name is Jens Chapman, and it's my great privilege to host you at the wonderful SSF facilities in Seattle, Washington, uh, to our uh, bi-monthly STED Talks, STED as in Spine Technology Education, and a Triple D. The Triple D is a discussion, debate, discourse, discovery also, you could add to that, of uh, spine-related topics. Uh, it is customary in CME talks like this one to give um, conflicts of interest disclosures, and our honorary guest speaker today uh, fulfills me with greatest conflict of interest. Dr. Paul Anderson is a professor of orthopedic surgery, rehabilitation medicine, and neurological surgery at the University of Wisconsin. He comes live to us from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he is my faculty mentor. He was the person who basically inspired me and educated me in all things spine, and I hope I fulfill him at least remotely with some pride. Uh, he's been a fellowship director for many, many uh, young and uh, not so young uh, spine surgeons around uh, North America, and he remains an eminent uh, presence throughout. He was at the University of Washington as a professor, then went uh, through a private practice period and has been at the University of Wisconsin now for, I believe, 15 years, where he's been an essential part of their eminent faculty. His uh, topic uh, is going to pertain to something that is so profoundly important for all of us. And as all of you who watch us uh, know, we usually show uh, cases first and then have the essential presentation take place. But in this case, we're going to flip it around because his talk is on osteoporosis, a topic he's been essential and uh, pioneering in in our organized orthopedic world, for instance, in the AAOS and the AOA. He has run the own the bone campaign for quite a while and very successfully. So raising awareness of bone health, not just in surgical circles, but also in the general practitioner community and in the general population is essential. And without much further ado, Paul, I'll ask you to take the next 20 to 30 minutes to present us your um, lecture, and then we'll have two or three cases for you presented by two of our fellows to kind of apply the principles that we've hopefully have learned. Without much further ado, Welcome to Seattle from Madison, Wisconsin, Paul, and I'll be seated and quiet. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Jens. It's uh, always great uh, to participate in these kinds of things. And let's see if we can share my screen. And are we sharing it? Yes, we just press the presentation mode. Yeah. OK, so my talk is titled What You Do Not Know Will Hurt You. And really, it's osteoporotic considerations before surgery. Uh, I have the following financial disclosures. None of those will really be pertinent to this talk. Uh, the objectives are to consider the linkage of osteoporosis and poor outcomes of spine surgery encourage spine surgeons to assess bone health, and then utilize bone health optimization as part of your practice. I'll start with a case example. This is a 78-year-old female we saw late last year. She had a history of osteoporosis, was treated for two years of a lendronate, but because she was having some dental procedures, it was stopped, never continued. She was rheumatoid, steroid dependent, and with status post L4-5 fusion, she developed a herniated disc at L3-4, was treated with an MIS microdiscectomy at an outside facility. Post-op was a pretty rocky course, may have had an infection, was treated with antibiotics. And she presented to us uh, now one month later with a fracture of the uh, inferior end plate of L3, a gapped open disc space, wasn't clear if there was an ongoing infection. But we retrospectively measured her uh, bone mineral density estimation with Hounsfeld units, which you can see on the right part of your screen, uh, where you draw elliptical region of interest. It was 91, indicating osteoporosis. Well, because she was so markedly unstable through that disc space, uh, we treated her with a debridement, partial corpectomy and reconstruction. That's a um, 
ehumeral allograft was placed through a lateral MIS kind of approach. And then we also did posterior instrumentation. Uh, unfortunately, at uh, one month post-op, she was in therapy doing extremely well, was actually on an exercise bike, felt a pop in her back, developed a T12 fracture. And then uh, we've slowly watched her fracture collapse till she's got a severe kyphotic deformity with now retropulsion of bone. And this is very predictable based on her bone density, her past medical history, maybe preoperative treatment was indicated for her bone health. And the question I would ask is, will if we keep reoperating, will this process ever stop? Not sure it will until we go occiput to the pelvis. So what is osteoporosis? And, and this is actually hard to define. There's a lot of controversy, surprisingly, about this. But it's functionally, it's diminished bone mineral density and bone quality that is increased fracture risk. Bone, measure, bone mineral density is easily measured with DEXA, uh, you, or we can estimate it with CT Hounsfeld units. But bone quality is much harder to measure, and that's independent of bone density. So bone quality re refers to mineralization defects from conditions such as osteomalacia or vitamin, most common being vitamin D deficiency. Uh, could be collagen disorders like Marfan syndrome, OI, or even severe nutritional deficiencies. And then also a process called degraded microarchitecture. And this is really changes in the trabecular structure, cross-linking of the trabeculi, the size, the porosities that lead to increased fragility. There are ways to measure these, uh, but they aren't widely available clinically. So the World Health Organization classified osteoporosis using the T-score. Most of us are used to that. Uh, T-score greater than one is minus one is normal. Osteopenia is minus one to minus 2.5. And then osteoporosis is less than 2.5. The problem with this is that it only explains 50% of fractures in that if you do bone marrow density on people with fragility fractures, Less than half are actually osteoporotic, and it doesn't really aid treatment decisions because we don't know what to do with that osteopenia group. Clearly, the osteoporotic probably need medication, but what about the osteopenia? Well, a few years ago, the National Osteoporosis Foundation developed what's called the clinical definition. This is really what applies to our patients, and this is what I would urge all spine surgeons to use this definition. And it's, again, a T-score of minus 2.5. But if they have a history of a hip or spine fracture since age 50, they are osteoporotic. Uh, if they're osteopenic and they have other fractures, like a distal radius fracture, then they're osteoporotic. Or if they have high fracture risk in the future or fracture probability. And this can be measured by a tool called the FRAX. Most of you probably are not uh, familiar with FRAX, so I will go over it. Uh, but uh, in spine surgery patients, using this NOF classification will double the incidence of osteoporosis compared to the WHO criteria from study I published earlier this year. So what is the relevance or prevalence of these deficiencies in uh, bone health? in spine patients. Well, vitamin D deficiency alone is ubiquitous. In Korea, by the study by Kim, 100% of people were uh, deficient, uh, whereas around the United States, 30, 40% will be insufficient uh, and up to 50% deficient, which is a minus 20 nanograms per millimeter, per milliliter. So it's very high incidence. And I think you can just assume almost all patients are going to be vitamin D. D deficient, before you do a fusion, maybe you should correct this. It's very easy done, which I'll talk about in a minute. Well, what about osteoporosis itself? These are five studies that looked at the prevalence of osteoporosis using the World Health Organization diagnosis. If you look at the bottom of that slide, somewhere between 10 and up to even 40% of patients will be osteoporotic, and only at maximum half will have normal bone. Well, what are the consequences of osteoporosis? I could go through hundreds of articles about this. I'm just going to review one. 
Uh, but this was a nice one out of the Mayo Clinic where they just classified uh, osteoporotic complications as kyphosis, pseudarthrosis, periprosthetic or perioperative fracture or hardware failure. All of these patients had DEXA scans were classified and almost half the patients with osteoporosis developed a non-union, whereas only 18% in the other classifications. And it was almost linear to the number of osteoporotic-related complications. And there was, this is not a long list, but half the patients osteoporotic had some kind of complication. So what are the consequences of poor bone health in spine surgery patients? Well, Post-op complications are much more common. All of these, screw loosening, hardware failure, increased spondy, proximal junction kyphosis, new fractures, sacral and pelvic insufficiency fractures, non-union reoperations, all of those are linked to osteoporosis in a variety of studies. And just to show that I'm modern and I can use emojis, I thought I'd throw in this emoji because this is something that we just don't want to see happen. Well, does mitigation of osteoporosis, is it effective using drugs? Well, there are two classes of drugs. There's the anti-resorptives most common are bisphosphonates and denosumab. Denosumab is a rank ligand inhibitor. And these will increase bone mass slightly, but they reduce fracture risk by at least 50%, some of them even higher. And then there are the anabolic that actually promote bone formation, teriparatide, abaloperatide, or both PTH hormones, and romazosumab is a sclerostin inhibitor. Uh, and all of these will increase bone mass 14 to 20% within two e years and reduce fracture risk up to 75%. So these are highly effective medications. Air surgeons are worried about the effect of bisphosphonates on fusion. And I can say that meta-analyses and systematic reviews show no effect of, of bisphosphonates on fusion. So here are six randomized controlled trials comparing bisphosphonates to spine fusions. They, they have four different outcomes, clinical results, time to fusion, fusion success, and hardware failure. And not all the studies had all of the outcomes reported. Uh, notice all of these are from Asia, but four of the six showed a positive effect of bisphosphonates on clinical and radiographic outcomes. Two were negative studies that showed no change between placebo. So these show, again, improved outcomes, positive effect on bone healing, and reduction of complications. But what about uh, anabolics? The only one that's really been studied in this vein is teriparatide. And again, the same kind of outcomes for trials. Uh, these are not as good quality as actually the bisphosphonate trials, but all of them were positive in favor of teriparatide over placebo. And anabolic agents, again, had positive effect on bone healing. The clinical outcomes didn't vary, but and they probably reduced bone-related complications. Well, how long do you need to give something uh, like teriparatide? This is an interesting study where they took osteoporotic patients who were going to have fusions. They randomized them for two months preoperative teriparatide versus placebo control. And then they measured insertional torque, and they found statistically improvement of torque of pedicle screws within two months, indicating a very short period of time, you can see improvement in mechanical strength. So uh, how do you put all this together? Well, you need to consider developing a bone health optimization program. And this is a process uh, starts with bone status assessment, identifying correcting metabolic de deficits and initiate treatment when appropriate for skeletal structural defects, e.g. osteoporosis. So the idea is to improve outcomes, reduce complications, and we want to try to make this cost effective. Uh, so how do you approach this program? Well, it's like any other quality improvement programs. It has to have a systematic or programmatic approach. It's comp could be comprehensive. You need to risk stratify patients somehow. It should be easy to apply in a, any surgeon's office. And obviously, being evidence-based is best. And it's the same as you do for any other quality improvement program. So the basically are three steps. You screen the patient, determine if they need testing. You do a test. If the test is positive, then you optimize. So let's take some examples of what we already do. 
Uh, we asked patients, oh, you have a history of diabetes. If you do, then we would check a hemoglobin A1C to see what their control is. If it's not satisfactory, then you might send them to get their blood sugars optimized. Similarly, you would evaluate cardiac risk, maybe ask them how many METs they can do. Uh, if they fail that, then you would do cardiac testing or see a cardiologist. And then if that was needed, then they would be optimized. So how does osteoporosis work? Well, the same way. You screen the patients in the office to determine who needs a DEXA scan. There might be other tests, such as laboratory tests, but I'm only going to focus on DEXA right now. Uh, then you would, in those patients, you would perform DEXA testing. If the testing ends up with a diagnosis of osteoporosis, then you would optimize that patient. So uh, this is a, a paper that was written as a review paper by uh, myself, Dr. Schuhart, who works at uh, Swedish in bone health. And it's a really position statement to uh, tell orthopedic surgeons who should be assessed before surgery. And I've modified that to simplify it a little bit. This is our protocol we're using at the University of Wisconsin. And we ask four questions. If you're female greater than 65, male greater than 70, if you have a history of fragility fracture after the age of 50, or if you have a high FRAX or FRAX uh, prediction, which I will talk about in a second, greater than 8.4%. If you, either, any one of those questions is positive you, and you haven't had a DEXA within the last two years, you should have a DEXA scan. This is done preferably at the time of surgery scheduling because we always have usually more than a month backlog. Uh, but you could apply this to any new patient and just screen everybody with this protocol as well. And it would probably be better, beneficial because eventually even the ones you treat non operatively might become surgical candidates, but it'd be better to have their bone health optimized. So what is FRAX? Well, FRAX has inputs in these are the inputs in FRAX, age, sex, prior fragility fracture, body mass index, cortical steroid use, secondary osteoporosis, rheumatoid, parent with hip fracture, smoking, alcoholic use, and BMD from DEXA, which is optional. You goes into a black box based on a lot of epidemiologic data and outcomes, your 10-year probability of a hip fracture or what's called a MOF or major osteoporotic fracture. So you have inputs, you go into a black box, you get outputs. That's how this instrument works. Uh, and the criteria again, to determine who needs formal DEXA testing is a major osteoporotic fracture risk greater than 8.4%. Now, just to say this uh, medically, how clinicians use this oftentimes is they will use a MOF of greater than 20, or hip fracture risk greater than 3% to decide who needs pharmacologic treatment. So this is the FRAX from the website uh, that you have to go to. You put in these inputs. Again, here's an example of a patient that I had from Wisconsin, 69-year-old, a little bit overweight, uh, had a mother with a hip fracture, but no other risk factors. We didn't have BMD put in her numbers, and she had a major osteoporotic fracture risk of 14%, which means she met the screening criteria, and she should have formal DEXA testing. This is actually part of our EPIC health link. There's something called health decisions. This is a data on program your institution would have to apply, but if they have this, this is really nice because this calculates the FRAX for you mostly. Uh, this screen comes up. Most of the information is blown in, and there may be just one or two clicks to complete this, and then you get a FRAX. So this is a patient who had a, who, uh, had a very high fracture risk, 5.6 hip fracture. So this is available in EPIC for those who have this health decision tool. If you don't have it, you might want to ask your administrators about getting it. Uh, and then this is the same patient I showed earlier, but now I did a DEXA scan on her. Her T-score was minus 2.5, and now her hip fracture risk, again, 5.9%, indicating that she probably needs pharmacologic treatment. So how effective is this screening protocol? Well, we did a study of 628 orthopedic patients. They were hip, knee replacement, shoulder replacement, as well as spine surgery 
thor columbar fusions all over the age of 50 we assessed how many of those people met the criteria and then what was the sensitivity of identifying osteoporosis the sensitivity was 100 percent. so we screened patients we were able to identify everybody uh, who ultimately had osteoporosis the specificity was 61 percent indicating there are 39 percent false positives which is a really pretty good uh, diagnostic test it even got better in spine if you just looked at the spine patients where the sensitive specificity was over 70 percent so this is a very simple thing that can be applied by anybody and it really identified patients who need dexa to formally determine if they have osteoporosis well dexa is the standard measurement i just want to go over uh that you need to learn how to read dexa scans Remember, the data is usually reported as a T-score, which is the bone mineral density of the patient minus the bone mineral density of a standard divided by the standard deviation of the standard. So think of it as the number of standard deviations away from a control, which is 20 to 30-year-old females, is what the T-score is. Uh, when you look at the DEXAs, you're going to get various numbers. And really what we're interested in are the total hip, femoral neck, the spine, usually L1 to L4, and the wrist. However, do not, in spine patients, do not look at the spine because most of the time it is artificially elevated because of deformity or degenerative changes. In my own cohort of about 300 patients, the spine T-score was 1 to 1.5 standard deviation higher than the hip because of the degeneration and deformity. And also, uh, you should calculate a frax at the time of the DEXA scan. Another uh, component of DEXA that can be ordered if you have this available, when you order for a spine patient, I would urge you to ask for a vertebral fracture assessment. This can be done at the DEXA. This is basically laying the patient on their side, doing a lateral x-ray. And because the x-ray beam moves down the length of the patient, you avoid parallax and you actually get a very high quality x-ray. And what we're looking for is occult fractures and they'll be present in 20 to 30% of the patients who are being scanned. And this will significantly improve your ability to diagnose osteoporosis. Another thing that we as spine surgeons should always do is use the CT scan opportunistically. Uh, if you have a elliptical or oval tool, you draw a circle on the L on the vertebrae, and you can do it both coronally, sagittally, or uh, axially, it will give you something called the Hounsfeld units. The Hounsfeld units are related to bone mineral density, and there have been thresholds established. And at L1, if you have less than 110, you most likely will have osteoporosis. If you're over 150, you probably are normal. In between, you may have osteopenia and you may need to do a DEXA scan, but the critical one is 110. If you're less than that, that patient likely has osteoporosis. I would say anecdotally, if you're less than 80, your screws are gonna have issues with pull-out strength and you'll have more likely fractures. So if you make a diagnosis of osteoporosis preoperatively, what do you do then? Well, we would suggest you go see a bone health specialist like Dr. Schuhart in Seattle. We have a fracture liaison service run by a PA, and that's who sees these patients. Is What the bone health specialist does, screen for secondary causes, check vitamin D level, make lifestyle changes, assess ball risk, maybe prescribe exercise for that. Uh, supplement calcium, vitamin D, and proteins if needed. And then if they meet qualifications or indications for medications, then we would stop them. Most of the time, we're going to use anabolics, if at all possible, because they may help the fusion process. Although anti resorptives as I said earlier, are certainly acceptable. Well, one of the things that everybody should do is give patients you're thinking of operating on at the time of surgery scheduling, or even earlier if you've seen them before that, to take vitamin D supplementation. If you, you, you can use two to 5,000 units daily for six or eight weeks, you're not gonna hurt anybody. I would always use vitamin D3. Some of the assays of vitamin D do not 
calculate vitamin D2 into that. So always use vitamin D3. And this is very safe. And in our hands, uh, 124 patients, 90% of them were vitamin D replete within six weeks just using this uh, dose. Uh, and we don't really test them until we make a diagnosed osteoporosis, in which case we would test them. In Wisconsin, because of a high latitude like Seattle does, we actually reinforce beer. Uh, Schlitz Beer actually puts vitamin D in their beer, and that works very well for our trauma population. So our trauma populations all have high vitamin D levels, assuming they drink Schlitz Beer. Well, ultimately, this may become a decision about do you need to delay surgery? Certainly, you would, except in emergency situations, delay surgery if they had excessive cardiac risk or diabetes, poor diabetic control. Same thing would be true here. Uh, what are some of the considerations about delaying surgery? Well, you need to know what the requirements for the bone health is. If you're doing a 12-level revision surgery with two osteotomies, you have a high need for really quality bone. Uh, also, if you have T-scores of minus four, that's a high need. Uh, and then you have to balance it against the urgency. If the patient's got neurologic problems, you'll probably just do all this post-op. And a lot of this is unfortunately opinion-based rather than, but this is our protocol. If you're doing minimal requirements, such as a stenosis decompression with diagnosis osteoporosis, we would like to delay, delay surgery a couple of months. If you're doing one or two level fusions, maybe three to six months. And if you're doing those big revision surgeries, multi-level fusions, then six to 12 months. Uh, not a lot of science here. This is just recommendations, anecdotal by myself. Primary treatment, again, is going to be an anabolic agent along with the uh, replacement of vitamin D and calcium. So conclusion is, first of all, recognize that osteoporosis is a big problem and that the spine surgeon needs to take ownership. We cannot count on primary care to do this, and there are not enough bone health specialists to take this task on. Orthopedic patients that you're seeing over the age of 50 determine if a DEXA is indicated. Uh, get them started on vitamin D and calcium as soon as possible and treat the bone disease both preoperatively and postoperatively and try to develop bone health service within your own local community. Many are done with uh, orthopedic organizations such as Own the Bone, uh, or it can be done in the community like you would do at Swedish with Dr. Schuhart. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I'll ask one of our fellows to come up who's gonna be first. Uh, Paul, so thank you. This is a great uh, lecture, and obviously you've done so much to raise uh, awareness of osteoporosis and also work on having a structured or programmatic approach towards dealing with this problem. Uh, one very hey, brief... Yes. Can you Dr. hear me? Dr. Schuhart is on the phone. you want to see if he has any comments, being a bone health specialist? Um, absolutely. I was going to actually call upon him also. So oh. why, don't I, why don't I hit you first, Paul, and then ask Chris the same question. Um, when we have patients who are sick and we have to operate on them pretty rapidly, and one of those cases will show that we obviously don't have the luxury of a year or two of anabolic medications, et cetera. Um, what should we do in terms of trying to accommodate for these patients um, uh, in terms of not just trying to change our implants, but also trying to kind of minimize their risks of hardware pull -out? Do we have any pharmacologic a uh, reasonable hope for uh, alleviation of the expected complications. Yeah, I think uh, that you certainly treat them for their osteoporosis postoperatively. There's no reason not to do that. And when to start that, it, you know, I would wait two, three, four weeks. You need to get the patient fully evaluated before you start them on medicines. A lot of them, if they're anabolic, they're all going to require pre-authorization. So I would just get that patient treated postoperatively, just like you would a fracture, let's say, a fracture patient. We're not treating them before, before they fracture, but after the fracture. So I'd treat them in the same way. Uh, is it going to be as effective? We don't know. Uh, as I said, there's uh, linking outcomes to the preoperative optimization uh, look like it's going to work, uh, but I, I still think you can just do it retrospectively if that's uh, reasonable. 
Hey, Chris. So um, I'm going to start in clinic. I just screened my uh, clinic schedule on our Epic, uh, which is, by the way, a Wisconsin product. Um, uh, so thank you, Wisconsin. Um, I'm probably going to have three quarters of my patients be candidates for you. How can I get access to your clinic? You're one of the most sought after people in the entire Swedish system. Uh, this is a, a massive problem, and we just don't have a good systems answer so far. So how soon before my patients uh, get surgery should we start some anabolic therapy, and how can we kind of optimize access to valuable colleagues like yourself? Well, uh, thanks, Jens, for that. Uh, you know, I think uh, we, we had challenges with this before uh, the COVID emergency. We actually have uh, fewer challenges after the COVID emergency. I, I seem to be able to get new patients in earlier, but I agree with Paul that um, a systematic approach to this, um, you know, in a, a, a philosophy that we need to take care of these patients because really bad things happen to them um, with, after really complicated, morbid, expensive surgery, really bad things happen to them if we don't take care of this underlying bone strength problem. In the, in the bone health world, we talk about fractures as sentinel events. And in a way, in these patients, hardware pullout, um, you know, adjacent segment fracture, all those things, those are sentinel events in these patients. We don't want them to happen. Um, I, the thing I agree with in Paul, and I think something we're marching towards very slowly at Swedish, and I think lots of other facilities around the country need to start to think about this, is a systematic approach. And that means a program. Program means people, and it means money. Uh, but what we see, and uh, uh, Paul is aware of this paper that was uh, published a few years ago, uh, the author is Ganda, um, uh, based on fractures, is that the more intensive, focused, and sort of centralized a program is, the less likely it is that uh, people are going to have bad outcomes, at least from osteoporosis. And I think that would translate directly. We are marching towards this ever so slowly at Swedish now. Finally, after 10 years, we have a move afoot to put together a fracture liaison program at Swedish based on vertebral fractures. So we would be case finding our patients with vertebral fractures, bringing them into a system and a program that really is generally led by uh, a, sort of a mid-level practitioner and um, getting those patients the treatment they deserve. So thank you both. <clears throat> I'm gonna now put both of you onto the panel as experts and uh, presenting a first case to put our theories to uh, test is Dr. Ryan Goodmanson. Lee, can we switch the camera to Dr. Goodmanson? Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan Goodmanson. Thank you so much for being here. I have a short, just illustrative case of some things maybe to for consideration and then um, to illustrate some of the points. So this is an 85 year old, uh, 85 years old young patient, uh, female, uh, who presented with low back and buttock pain. She had pain rating in, down into her legs, uh, weakness, which was somewhat acute in her right lower extremity, um, and had developed over the past couple of weeks. She was uh, somewhat of a victim of the whole pandemic situation, uh, but she has now progressed to the inability to ambulate. Uh, due to her back pain, leg pain, and weakness. She's not having any bowel or bladder uh, issues, but you can see her uh, standing films as well as a flexion film there showing um, fairly uh, uh, severe arthritis, spondylosis. She has a grade one to two spondylolisthesis at L4-5. Um, and kind of overall, uh, you can see 85-year-old anatomy. Um, these are just some representative MRI uh, slices. You can see that she has fairly significant stenosis at the 2-3 uh, region as well as the 3-4 region and 4-5 region. And I, sorry, that was quick. I can go back through those as well, um, which are likely representative of her symptoms. Um, she uh, also had a somewhat of a workup preoperatively. However, I would maybe argue that it was a little bit suboptimal. Um, her albumin was 4.6, which was normal. Hemoglobin A1C was 5.3. She did have a DEXA scan, which was over a year old, and showed that she was osteoporotic uh, at a T-score of less than uh, 2.5. Um, so we talked with her fairly extensively, and she did get to do a little bit of prehab and conservative measures, but 
the acute change in her right lower extremity and the inability to ambulate pushed us towards operating a little bit quicker, I think, uh, in this individual. And so we planned on doing a laminectomy from L1 to L5. Uh, we would try and do midline sparing up above uh, and then do as minimally uh, um, a minimal surgery uh, as far as stabilization of her spondylolisthesis as it was mobile. Um, at L45 with the T lift. We did plan at this time to do fenestrated and cemented screws, and this is uh, essentially off label for this. However, uh, we could potentially argue uh, a more end of life type situation. So this is uh, just some representative images of what was done, and I'll show you the CT scan. You can see that at L45, we were able to do a T lift in this region, and the screws were augmented and fenestrated. Here's a CT scan uh, showing the cage placement, a uh, decent reduction of the spondylolisthesis, decompression, and then uh, the uh, fenestrated screws used for uh, cement augmentation. Here's a um, kind of post hoc uh, CT showing her Hounsfield units as she did not have a preoperative CT, which is maybe one of the considerations beforehand. Um, but her mean Hounsfield units were somewhere around 100, which uh, we have talked about before and Dr. Anderson talked about uh, probably being um, a threshold for uh, augmentation in her. Uh, she did fairly well after this uh, surgery. She went home on post-operative day two. Uh, she was regaining function in her right lower extremity and was able actually to get up to the commode and walk around. So some of the considerations for her being, you know, what do we do preoperatively for these patients like we talked about? This was somewhat of an acute situation where um, she she was needing uh, some type of surgery. Uh, she could have had a bigger surgery based on her anatomy and her, um, and her issues, but we tried to limit it as much as possible for her while still gaining um, uh, uh, what we needed to in order to treat her correctly. Thank you, Ryan. So two questions for our two uh, eminent panelists, uh, and I want to rehash one theme beforehand. So this is a relatively acute situation. Uh, clearly an at-risk patient, look at the, I think it's L1 vertebra, which has already a, a long-standing uh, compression fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, in your risk algorithm, is there a threshold uh, where we should start thinking about supplemental fixation if we have to do urgent surgery? And then to Dr. Schuhart, why do we have to wait for several weeks before we start anabolic medications postoperatively? So maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Schuhart first. Why do we have to wait for several weeks before we start on medications? Uh, well, particularly regarding anabolic medication yens, um, I think the the, the the really two issues that come up for me, and they're not medical, um, they are they are uh, operational. The first is these are extremely expensive medications. Uh, I don't think we have any cost analysis um, uh, regarding uh, using these medications in these patients, and uh, and so what's going to happen is if you start these medications in the hospital. Uh, the notwithstanding any of the metabolic changes that may happen, largely hypercalcemia would be the concern. Um, it's going to add to the DRG massively, and you're going to hear about it. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, and, and this would be a training uh, and education issue, is that my experience for patients coming into the hospital for all kinds of problems, bringing their anabolic therapy with them uh, to get their um, uh, elective hip replacement is that the, the s staff and teams in the hospital are so unfamiliar with these medications that stupid things happen to them. Uh, like their uh, teriparatide gets left unrefrigerated overnight on the patient's bedside stand mm -hmm. because the patient is self-administering or the staff doesn't know how to administer it. Um, so, so they're really functional um, and not medical issues, although I would be concerned about the potential for hypercalcemia and what that would do to people in the hospital. It would kind of throw them into a tizzy. Why is the patient hypercalcemic? Oh, you know, we've never used teriparatide before. Uh, it can do that. So those would be my two concerns. Let me latch on a question before I go to Paul, uh, and that is, um, uh, again, in terms of uh, trying to um, operationalize osteoporosis care. In this patient, uh, wouldn't it be nice to start the lab workup early after surgery? And do we have at this point in time in EPIC a simple osteoporosis one uh, operational order to basically just order all the labs that you need to then four weeks after surgery, hopefully seeing this patient? 
Um, so yeah, it would be pretty easy to do that. Again, some of the metabolic shifts postoperatively, we, you know, draw serum calcium on this patient after 24 hours, and they're probably going to be hypocalcemic in the hospital. Um, we lost your audio, Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Now you're good. Uh, it, it's on. Okay. Um, so doing a workup in the hospital is certainly feasible. We do not have a simple one button. Here's your osteoporosis um, smart set um, for inpatient or for outpatient. Um, some of the metabolic changes that happen in these patients, particularly in the first 24 hours, a lot of them are going to be hypocalcemic postoperatively. That would be a contraindication to use of bisphosphonate if that's what you're going to use. So you'd have to be able to filter through um, some of the lab abnormalities, uh, but you certainly could do that. Vitamin Ds, again, you're adding to the DRG. Um, 24 hour urine calcium, which is a favorite of people like me. Uh, great time to do it in the hospital uh, if if you think you're in a sort of a, a stable state and patient may have a catheter in, for instance. Uh, but um, there, there's nothing that we have right now that's plug and play for metabolic workup aside from what you would do normally coming in CBC chemistry, et cetera. Vitamin D ahead would be would be great. Would be great. So, Paul, I've always, as a fellow and um, long-term disciple of yours, appreciated your very algorithmic, uh, clear thinking. Um, are we somewhere where, um, uh, in your assessment, a bad prognosis patient like this one uh, will also kind of have to be considered for amendments to our standard surgical care. Um, as I, everybody knows, I'm very sensitive and apprehensive of cement use, but this is a classic case of if you don't do something supplemental, it'll fall apart. So where are we with a more algorithmic, systematic approach to alert surgeons to consider alternative or supplemental measures? Uh, Paul, you're off right now, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Thank you. Yep, that's a great question, and um, I've thought about, about this a lot. We don't have thresholds to tell us what to do. However, I have kind of come up with my own based on, this would be Hounsfeld units, uh, but if I have a patient who has less than 110 and I'm going to put in pedicle screws, and I'm going to do what you just did, which is use fenestrated screws. And then at the time of surgery, I can decide if I want to cement them. If for some reason the purchase seemed awesome, then I might not cement them. But if uh, there was any question, I would cement them. So uh, if they're less than 80, I'm thinking about backing out of surgery for the time being and getting them treated preoperatively. Now, if you had to, then I would go in with the plan. I'm going to cement those screws. There are other options, you know, you can put more screws in. The problem with more screws is you just transfer and increase bending moments at the next level that's more likely to break. So I don't know if that's really solving much issue for you. Uh, the use of inner bodies. If you look at that lateral x-ray or CT scan, that patient's already failed two end plates at the adjacent levels. Uh, I think it's L3 and L1. Both have end plate failures. You might call them Schmorl's nodes but they're really failures of those end plates. And you have to ask yourself, is an inner body going to even do anything in a severely osteoporotic bone? So a lot of times, although you'd love to put in uh, an inner body to add to your anterior column strength, it may not buy you very much because it's just going to subside. So I kind of go a little bit more minimalistic in that situation, frankly. But that's how I use Hounsfeld units to help me decide if I'm going to absolutely cement the screws or if I'm going to put them in and when I will use fenestrated screws. Now, if the patient has Hounsfeld units more than 150, I just prefer regular screws because I think they're less likely to fracture down the road because they don't have the holes in them. And you remember when they came out with the CSLP plate, they had fenestrated screws and we just saw them break all the time. Great, thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Schell. And by the way, the screen view showed that we are socially distancing in our lecture room, but we have a very nice group of international attendees. So a shout out to all of our friends and I see Lebanon, I see uh, several Latin American countries. So thank you for joining us this morning. Dr. Ben Schell is one of our eminent fellows. He's gonna go to South Carolina, uh, Charleston, and uh, he's a, been a great fellow. And he's gonna present a 
Do I see that right? 91-year-old patient, Ben? 91 years young. Uh, so it's a 91 years young uh, female. Uh, no trauma, no inciting event. But she said this kind of chronic low back pain for about seven months by the time she got to us. We've uh, dug up some films from initial uh, injury. By the time she got to us, she was seven months out. She had osteopenia diagnosed on a DEXA scan back in 2014. Um, when she came to us again, she had some intermittent urinary incontinence, which is different than her baseline. And she's unable to walk or stand due to pain. This lady's very active at baseline, uh, you know, lives by herself, um, still drives, uh, active swimmer. You know, she is uh, still able to do very much things on her own. And so these are some of her original films um, that were from the time of injury. And you can see right down there the uh, initial burst fracture, not much deformity yet. And then here is her initial MRI that was obtained. Again, you see the, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't display well. Uh, it's kind of dark on my screen. Hopefully you guys at home can see it. Uh, not much stenosis in the beginning, um, but um, still having some pain. So then she, uh, you know, tries some non-operative management, um, goes from outside hospitals, eventually gets to us. She's now seven months out. The pain's getting worse. She's unable to stand. And we have this CT scan, which has kind of shown the reabsorption of that fractured vertebral body, um, now worsening canal stenosis. And then here's the MRI as well when she came to us. So. Again, coercion canal stenosis, you see that signal uh, in the vertebral body where you're getting that AVN from, the, um, uh, from that fracture collapse. And so here's our CT uh, obtained at that time with the Hounsfield units highlighted at the levels uh, immediately adjacent. So at this point, she's kind of failed uh, bracing. Uh, we've had multiple discussions with her regarding pain and her quality of life. She's a very active lady. She's no longer independent. Uh, she's no, no longer able to do what she wants to do uh, in her life and, um, you know, kind of get some opinions on what we should do or I can go on. Uh, why don't you go on right now and then we'll ask our two panelists for sure. their comments. Sure. So uh, similar to what Dr. Gibbonson just presented, um, except these are not finished straight screws, this uh, we did a decompression infusion, um, uh, two levels up, two levels down, and with some cement at the uh, UIV and then LIV as well. So uh, the or UIV plus one UIV, and LIV plus one. So you can see there that the partial corpectomy uh, was performed um, from the posterior side. There was a discussion of possibly doing a lateral uh, later on if she um, uh, did not improve or was willing um, to consent to that surgery. Here are the um, x-rays as well. We've maintained the alignment. She's now about six weeks out. Uh, she's doing pretty well. Uh, the patient initially um, felt like she did okay and didn't want to uh, go back for the second surgery uh, to remove the um, rest of that vertebral body at the uh, injured site and then get the anterior column support. So, so there are a couple of things. Um, if you go back to the initial CT, and I want to talk about the missing cage since you brought that up later, Paul. Um, that initial CT, this was like, uh, like late last year, like October or so. Yeah. Going back to that fracture algorithm that you brought up, Paul, this is in retrospect, power of retroscopy, as we know, is uh, strong, uh, a missed opportunity. What in this fracture would lead you to uh, suspect that this will go badly over time? Obviously, we know this went very badly, but is there something that tips you off that this is not going to go well just by ignoring it, which was what was done? Yeah, I, I think it's always hard to predict which ones of these are going to go bad on you. But that there's such a void in the vertebral body or that big fracture cleft above the inferior end plate. And those always worry me because there's nothing there. Uh, maybe the disc is there. But basically what I've seen, and I think my case actually showed the same similar thing, is that vertebral body will just collapse and wedge. And it's interestingly... Uh, the only cases where I've seen fairly minimal burst fractures, even compression fractures, turn into bad burst fractures with a lot of retropulsion have been in the osteoporotic spines. Like the trauma patients with burst fractures, it was extremely rare that we saw the burst component to get much worse. You may, they might go into kyphosis, but I didn't see the bone retropulsing more. Whereas these osteoporotics, I've seen a compression fracture turn into a bad burst fracture over time. Uh, and this is why these patients need to be followed by a spine surgeon. Uh, and you need to pay a lot of attention to changes in alignment because early on you can do something. 
I don't think vertebroplasty would have been a good option here or kyphoplasty because of the retropulsion. Also, how much comminution that body is. I just don't think technically you could have achieved a lot. And I have done a number of cases where we're doing percutaneous instrumentation on osteoporotic fractures to prevent what ultimately happened here. The indications have been patients just doing clinically very poorly or progressive deformity. So it's not something you can necessarily say at day one, but fairly early on, we saw that these patients were not doing well, either radiographically or clinically, and we just put percutaneous screws in, cemented them in, and they did amazingly well. Let me uh, follow up uh, on this with a qu uh, question again, Paul. So you taught me something that uh, really opened my eyes, and that's the phenomenon of avascular necrosis in the spine. What is the correlation of this Camell's disease or avascular necrosis and osteoporosis? Is there one, and uh, what are the telltale signs? Thank you, Paul. Yeah, um, well, this is where that vertebral body just collapses and ends up being a big sequestrum of dead bone, theoretically. I don't know if anybody's actually shown histologically that that's dead bone, but that's what we call it. And it is, late in late cases, a reasonable uh, indication for vertebroplasty. You have to have a very exper experienced person to treat that because that do the cement could easily extravasate. And having some kind of containment devices as part of that cementing would be very helpful in this case. But that is would not be surprising. Again, it starts with that cleft like you're seeing there, that that is not going to heal well and going to end up with some dead bone there. Let me uh, expand this question to Chris now. So COVID has brought maybe some good things to us, a uh, few as there are, but telemedicine has finally arrived. You're an extremely sought after commodity. I'm not buttering up here, it's a fact. And again, there'll be probably five or six carefully selected referrals coming to you just today from my clinic. Uh, so. Is this something where, obviously in retrospect, this patient would have benefited from a spine surgeon consult, as Dr. Anderson said, which didn't happen. But we would also immediately call for your help. So this is something where telemedicine, because you don't really need to see those patients necessarily. Um, is this where telemedicine could be put to really good use to get this team medicine to the patient where they need it? Absolutely. Um, this is a place where, for instance, at the University of Washington, um, they're doing e-consult. And that's an, an, an inter-provider consultation, whether it's telemedicine or not. Uh, there's that capability in many departments in the UW. Um, we, we need to think about this in many ways. In fact, we just, on our RPM team meeting yesterday, discussed um, uh, ideas uh, about um, putting this together through the medical group, uh, SMG here at Swedish, so that um, we can do these, you know, what were formerly curbsides, you know, I, I, I remember hearing in medical school, if you want a 30-second opinion, you'll get a 30-second answer. Uh, but 10 minutes, um, you know, we could go through this in 10 minutes, and we could we could talk about what the opportunities were in this patient. And uh, I understand in this circumstance, um, you know, this, is, this, this patient needed to have an operation. But we could have co-parallel kinds of approaches where we are helping you or helping anyone launch, start to launch the treatment for this patient while they're getting their neurologic status fixed. Um, and and, and uh, I think in the long term, um, do the system and uh, the patient uh, quite a favor for that. So I'd be all in favor of some sort of telemedicine access. And now uh, we even have patients who are unfortunately and fortunately quite facile um, with this um, well up into, into ages where I never thought that that would be um, as viable as it, as it is um, using, using Zoom and things like that. So let's make that an action item. Now educate us, Happy both, to. both Paul and Chris, on the Hounsfield unit ROI circles. So I see them being drawn by Dr. Shell here in sagittal form. He came out of the OR late last night, so he did a really good job doing this on the fly. How do we correctly draw those so that we don't have artificially inflated or deflated values? Do we have to do them in the sagittal plane or in the axial plane? Can we do them in the coronal plane? Uh, so just a brief little uh, um, kind of a tutorial. We don't have live uh, uh, images here, so just give us an auditory kind of a instruction. So the uh, 
the thresholds have been established at L1 for on a sagittal view like you have here, mid-sagittal view. So you just make that a mid-sagittal view and you draw as big a circle or a ellipse as you can within the vertebral body. You exclude all the cortical margins and you also exclude any artifacts. And so if there's a void or something or area of sclerosis, you would try to avoid that. If L1 has screws in it or has a fracture, then you would go to L2 or T12 around it. You could do it on the axial images just as well. There's about a five point difference in my experience between axial, axial and sagittal, because you're measuring different bones, so uh, it's a little bit variable. The other area that you have to watch out for is contrast is in the spine, contrast will increase your Hansfeld units by 11 units. So I always just subtract 10. Interestingly, we use Hansfeld units to get us pre-authorization uh, for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. So we tell the insurers, and sometimes this sells it, even though their BMD is not osteoporotic according to the WHO definition, but we tell them they are according to Hansfeld units and we've had insurance companies accept that. Now, that took a lot of time for us to send them literature about it, back it up. Most of the literature is out of our university with our radiology department as well as myself. So we have a lot of experience. But that is something you can use. I don't know if you've tried that, Chris, but that is something that's been helpful to actually get approval. I would say the other thing is there um, pelvic insufficiency fractures and sacral fractures, which are certainly seen after these long fusions, there's a randomized control trial that shows that teriparatide improves their healing and decreases their pain much more rapidly. So those kinds of patients, I would call up Chris and say, we got to get this guy started or lady started as soon as possible on an anabolic. This might, this case might be the same thing is I would look at that and I say, this is a really high risk fracture. And that maybe a boost with an anabolic early on could help this thing and avoid the consequences. I don't know if it would have, probably wouldn't, but it's certainly not out of the box crazy thinking to get going with anabolic. There is some evidence that fracture pain from spine fractures goes down with anabolic treatment faster, uh, as well as bisphosphonates for that matter, compared to placebo. So that's another reason to think about treating it metabolically. Even more patients coming your way now, Chris. So, um, <clears throat> do your radi you like system solutions, Paul? Do your radiologists routinely obtain HU units by now uh, in at risk patients? Yes, we do. Uh, our uh, part of our uh, protocol now for abdominal and chest CTs, where you can see L1, is for them to do a Hounsfeld unit report that they give our the criteria which i gave to the primary care physician they don't tell you how to treat it they just say this is notable uh and that you may want to proceed with dexa in the last three minutes i have one more question so ben can you go to the post-op image and i'll ask paul in our time together at harbor you did a number of biomechanics studies and you always taught us we need an anterior column support we were going to do an anterior column support uh, with an X-lift procedure, and the patient could not tolerate a lateral position, and uh, we decided to abort the surgery. Since then, the patient has declined to do this. What are her chances to actually heal this without a real anterior column with the kind of hardware that we put in on the back? Yeah, did you do a posterior fusion posteriorly? We did a posterior or is this fusion. Uh, we did a, no, this is a formal posterior open procedure fusion. Okay. And we did an LI. Well, then she may not heal in the front. I'm not sure it's going to make a big difference in a 91 year old if you got a posterior fusion with the instrumentation. Uh, obviously, it'd be better if it heals. It may or may not. Uh, I haven't seen that be too big a problem. Now, if you didn't have a posterior fusion and you get a non-union anteriorly, then screws are going to break or loosen. Uh, but I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Does bracing help in these patients or not? Should we brace her? The, the bracing, as far as the fracture itself, has not been shown to be a benefit in osteoporotic fractures. Bracing after lumbar spine fusion, I would say, is highly controversial. I think at a 91-year-old tolerates bracing extremely poorly, and you're actually asking for complications 
related to, to brace, uh, donning it, keeping the patient in bed rather than mobilized. So I, I tend not to use them. So this brings us to the conclusion of the one hour of the Stead Talk. Uh, this has been a wonderfully instructive uh, session. I think it'll be downloaded a lot. And I want to thank all of our visitors. Uh, shout out to Dr. Vincent Arlet from the University of Pennsylvania, who just last night did a great, interesting case discussion with his team at the University of Pennsylvania. So if you haven't seen that, go to SSF TV and check out the last night's presentation of Dr. Arlet, which I had to miss because of the OR. But Paul, thank you for joining us. And Chris, thank you for being a member of our team. And giving your wisdom to us at all times. Very much appreciated. Have a great second half of 2020. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.